this very last session of Fast Pitches uh, from uh, a group of uh, ARPA-E uh, fellows and uh, program uh, directors. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for the questions that we're submitting uh, uh, from the audience, uh, just uh, want to remind everyone there is approximately a 160 character limit. So if you want your complete question to get through, um, either send it uh, uh, truncated or, uh, or hold it to that uh, 160 uh, characters. Um, I'm very excited to uh, serve as the moderator today uh, for, this, uh, for this particular session at uh, ARPA-E. Um, I think most of you are, are familiar with the, the uh, fast pitch uh, format. It basically is eight minutes. Uh, basically is an opportunity for uh, program directors and, uh, and fellows to uh, put out in front of the community a series of, um, of uh, programs that span the ARPA-E innovation pipeline cycle. So what you'll see here are programs that range from uh, ideation going all the way up through to mature programs. Um, and so with that, uh, since the clock is ticking and, and we're running a little bit late, I will introduce our first, uh, first uh, pitchy. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Pat McGrath. And uh, Pat will actually uh, start off uh, with uh, uh, giving us a, um, an update on, the, on a mature program, uh, AMPT. Good morning. Thanks, Joe. I'm Pat McGrath, I'm the program director for the AMPT program. That's the Advanced uh, Management and Protection of Energy Storage Devices. Uh, as Joe said, this is uh, a mature program. This is actually in its final year. Uh, so d what I'm going to tell you today is about what we did on the program, but more importantly, what we learned on the program and how we can use it going forward. Uh, so the title for my talk is Thinking Outside of the Cell for Better Batteries, and wanted to start with the cell itself and start with a reminder uh, that the lithium-ion battery is a miracle. Uh, we've got, maybe gotten quite used to it in our daily lives, but I, I think it's, it, it's uh, easy to lose sight of the fact that we're talking about a combination of thermodynamically unstable materials with a flammable electrolyte that we pack into a pressure vessel and subject to large electrical currents. So what, what could go wrong? Uh, but it's just by our, uh, the good fortune of a passivation layer that forms during the, the cycling of these that these work at all. And we're very lucky that it works, and just showing here the, the growth of uh, plug-in hybrids, um, but we're really just seeing the beginning of the impact for this. Lithium-ion batteries are going to be central to uh, meeting the, the emission standards for our fleet going forward over the next decade and beyond. And we're even just now seeing the very first entry into the grid to help uh, with the management of the grid and the increased penetration of renewables. So we're lucky that these work, and it's been the basis for quite a bit, but it was a lot more than luck that made this a reality. And what I'm going to talk about is that it took a lot of hard work because every battery out there is a system. It's not just a collection of cells. We can't strap these things together and hope for the best. We need to make sure that these things are going to operate safely and that they're going to operate reliably. And doing so requires a lot of additional components in, into a battery system. We need sensors. We need controls. We need thermal management. We need power systems. Broadly speaking, and taking a, a, a broad definition, this is what we're calling the battery management system, or the BMS. And we ask a lot of the BMS. It needs to get the best performance that we can out of the battery while operating safely, reliably, and over a long lifetime. But even with all of these components, even with all of the technology that we've built up over the years, we still have a problem, and that's that we don't really know what is happening inside the cell or throughout that battery pack. There are distributions in, in the thermal environment, in the impedance in the cells, and we really don't have any insight as to what's happening inside of the cells. So we have limited information, but we're asking now that the, the uh, battery management system, without knowing what's happening everywhere inside of the battery, make sure that nothing, happened, nothing goes wrong anywhere in the battery. And the only way to accomplish that today is to, to apply uh, some conservative operating constraints to make sure that none of the cells go anywhere near a limit where we might encounter a problem. And this is what the AMPS program was attacking, was if we can get better knowledge, if we can attack that uncertainty, 
we can push closer to the actual limits and get more performance out of our battery systems. And this means sensors that give us more and better information throughout the battery pack. This means models and controls that tell us about the dynamics of what's really happening inside of the cells and tell us about the actual physical mechanisms that lead to degradation. This means power systems that give us the flexibility to apply that information and those control limits in an intelligent way so that we're not limited by the weakest cell. And underlying all of this, we also have diagnostic and prognostic tools. Because even though none of the technologies that I'm talking about are specific to any one chemistry, we still do need to know about the, the cell that we're, we're putting together in this battery system. And in order to keep pace with the continuing innovation in the space, we need better tools so that we can speed up the, the development process for battery systems in addition to the cells themselves. Now, to tell you what we did, I'll give you the 15-second version. The challenge that we laid out for the community was to increase the utilization, get more energy out of the, out of the battery system without uh, changing the chemistry. So using the cells that we have, get more of the kilowatt hours that we paid for. We wanted to go that 20% or more increase in utilization. We want to push the charging rate, push, open up the operating limits so that we can get more charge into the cells, twice the rate of what we can do with existing systems. And we also, for the first time, want to be able to track and predict the health of these, of these batteries as they operate through their life to give us the ability to have uh, health conscious controls. And that's the 15 second version of what we did, but I'd really like to tell you a little bit more about what we learned. And to no one's surprise, the industry did not stop when we started this program. Cells continue to get better, they continue to get cheaper. And if we have technologies that are looking to make an improvement by getting more of the kilowatt hours that we paid for, well, as those kilowatt hours become cheaper, we need additional value. We need new things that we can bring to the table that you can't do another way if we want these new technologies to be implemented. And I want to give you two examples of, of how we've done that. So the first one, for those of you who've been here all week, you've already seen uh, this park technology in the video on Monday. Uh, this is an optical sensor that gives us insight into temperature and strain the, in, inside of the cells throughout the battery pack. And this gives us better certainty and gives us a better knowledge of what the state of charge is throughout the pack and gives us the ability to track state of health. All of that allows us to right size the pack to increase the utilization. But what we found and what we didn't expect at the beginning of the program was that there's additional benefit just to being optical. It's inherently isolated because the sensors are not electrical, because the communications to the sensors are not electrical. You don't need to isolate those components from the high, from the high voltage in the battery pack. And that in itself, has, has an inherent value in performance, and especially in cost, to knock the isolation out of that battery system. That alone is a value even independent of all the new capability we bring to the battery system. A second example comes from our project with Utah State. And this was looking at a, a distributed architecture of power electronics to give us the ability to address each cell individually so that throughout the charge-discharge you can actually balance and uh, treat the weaker cells with, with kid gloves so that they, don't, uh, that they don't age and they don't bring down the performance of the pack. This gives us the ability to increase the lifetime of the battery pack, and by, uh, by extension, you're able to right-size the pack so that you don't need the lifetime oversize. But again, in order to get the additional value, what we learned that we didn't expect at the beginning is that with this distributed architecture, even though we've increased the part count in a battery pack, we can actually tie them together through a shared 12-volt bus and power all of the auxiliary in a vehicle off of that bus. That gives you the ability to knock out an expensive uh, multi-kilowatt DC-DC converter that even though you've increased the part count, you can be cost neutral or even cost negative on getting this increased capability in the pack. So that's just a couple examples of uh, what we learned through the program, uh, but I'd really like to close with where does this go from here? And I have, and I have two uh, broad comments here, one for the, for the battery systems community and one for the larger community. Uh, so the first comment up there is, is, if you've seen one battery, you've seen one battery. And what I mean by that is that all of our teams have gone through their proof of concept and they're now in their validation testing on systems that they've spent quite a bit of time characterizing and building their systems in order to, to achieve the increases in utilization and, and performance that we've seen. Well, batteries continue to get better, systems continue to get better, and we need to go faster if we're going to be, have an impact and get these technologies into future battery systems. So that's a big part of our program was developing the diagnostic tools to do that, and we're now pushing forward. My last comment is for, for everybody who has an interest in energy storage, is that what we found in the AMP program, is we're just at the beginning of this, is that we can ask more from our battery systems. 
We can get more performance, we can get more lifetime, we can get more of the kilowatt hours that we paid for, and it's time to start uh, pushing for it. So it, 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 we've got two hours after the session is over down on the showcase floor, and I would just encourage you, find somebody from the AMP team. Talk to them. If you've got an interest, if you've got a need for your, for your energy storage system, find out the new possibilities that we've charted out on the AMP program and where we can take it going forward. Thank you. So, I'll hand off to the next talk to, to my colleague, Dr. Adrian Little, uh, a fellow at RPE, who will tell us about a new uh, concept that she's exploring. Thank you, Pat. Uh, so while as Pat was presenting something that's a little more of a mature program idea, what I'll be presenting to you is something that's very much uh, an upcoming idea. And the, the point is to give you an idea of where we can go for uh, potential future program ideas. Waiting for slides. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, so again, my name is Adrian Little. And I'll be talking to you about growing the next generation of high temperature heat exchangers. So by training, I am a mechanical engineer. And us mechanical engineers, you know, we come up with all sorts of great ideas. And we get asked this question, but can you make it? And, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable question. But in the end, it becomes the dreaded question. But can you make it? And often the answer is no, I can't make it. And let me give you some examples of how I couldn't make it. Uh, when considering compact heat exchangers, what you want to do is you want to make features as small as possible so that you, increase, you can increase surface area and increase heat transfer coefficient. But you're really limited to how small you can make the geometries in your heat exchanger. These are machining concerns. Uh, when looking at heat recovery steam generators, generators for waste heat recovery and uh, gas turbine power plants, we have these huge heat exchangers that are about six stories tall at least, and they're full of tu fin tubes and headers that are all connected with joints and welds. And what you run into here is a thermal cycling limit. How fast can you heat up and cool down this thing? And then when considering concentrated solar power, we have a receiver for the system that receives the solar radiation. And what happens here is we want to make that high temperature receiver as hot as possible so we can get the highest efficiency system. But in essence here, we're limited by the temperature limit that is imposed by the material we're using for the tubes in the heat exchanger. So if we simplify this a little bit, what's the story? The story is that a lot of small things are connected to make really big things. So there's a lot of joints. And at high temperatures, these joints fail. OK? So what's, what's the path forward? So in the US in this past year, there were 79 million tons of steel produced. And all that steel is going through some sort of manufacturing process, much like this one. For example, here, you're making a simple steel tube. You can see all the steps necessary. And this is just to make a tube. This is not the header. This is not the assembly process. This is just making the tube. So what do we, how do we move from there? What's the path forward? Well, what I'll be presenting to you is something I'm calling growing. You might call it something else. But the essential premise is harnessing self-assembling mechanisms in biology and in chemistry. So can you grow a heat exchanger like you would grow a tree? Well, maybe not. If you use that as a high temperature heat exchanger, you're probably going to set your tree on fire, all right? So, so what, what would this growing concept look like? It would be something that would be going beyond the concept of 3D printing. So here we have a chart of uh, cost per unit man manufactured versus the units manufactured. And with conventional manufacturing, your cost is mostly in tooling. So the more parts you can make with that tooling, the cheaper your parts become. But with additive manufacturing, the price is relatively level for the, uh, the number of units you manufacture. And part of the reason for this is that 3D printing is a process that's actually 2D. You're adding a bunch of 2D layers on top of each other. And this is an additive process. You're adding material when you, when you do this. But growing would be a little bit different. In some cases, the material's already there, but you treat it so that you grow a structure in that material. And this can be a process that gets exponentially faster with time because your surface area is gradually becoming larger and larger. So because you're playing with 3D structures,
can a growing process in some ways be fundamentally faster? Furthermore, if you're using some chemical assembly techniques, could you potentially play with high temperature materials, the type of materials we're interested in for heat exchangers? And so with that way, in that way, can we bring the cost of growing down below something that's more like additive manufacturing and have a new break-even point and open up the opportunities for what we can make? So grow, what would be some potential advantages of growing? Well, first, we can combine manufacturing processes. And this is nice because we can reduce cost and time, but also we can potentially reduce joints. And as I mentioned before, joints are bad. Uh, we have new material options, uh, pot uh, potentially higher temperature materials, ceramics, refractory metals, poten potentially graphite. And then, this is probably the most interesting one, microstructure customization. And with that, not only can you make new things, but you can have new enabling properties that you can play with maybe strength at higher temperature, maybe a self-healing ability. So what are some sample growing paths? You know, I've kind of talked about this in an abstract sense, but what are some ideas I've had for what growing would look like? And so one sample path would, uh, in essence, be using biology as the machinist. So can we copy a structure in biology? That's, that's been done in many ways before. But also, can we copy a biological process, which is not done as much when thinking about uh, energy? So for example, we have a mushroom here. I don't know about you guys, but the underside of that mushroom looks a lot like a radiator to me. Can we copy that structure? But the other interesting thing about a mushroom is that it's a two-stage process. There's the first process uh, produces the cells. This is a slow proce process and an energy-intensive process. But the second step is to inflate these cells, and that's when you actually see the mushroom come out of the ground. That's quite fast. Can we copy that process somehow? Also, could you take bacteria, texture a surface, increase your surface area for heat transfer? Uh, there's diatoms. These are naturally strong structures. Can we copy that somehow? And then this is a cross-section of wood. A tree is actually a great pump, if you think about it. It takes a lot of water from the ground up, and it's because it's full of capillary structures. Can we copy those structures somehow? But of course, biological structures are kind of mushy. They're kind of, uh, they're not super solid. So we would need a strengthening process. We know how to plasticize biological material. We see fossilization in nature. But can we metallize? Can we ceramatize? Is there a chemical pathway there to solidify some of these really interesting structures? And then, uh, can we make joint-free parts this way? Since we're growing them, they're essentially all one part. And in that, we can have a continuous microstructure and potentially reduce thermal cycling fatigue. The second sample is using uh, chemistry as the carpenter. And this is maybe the less literal translation of grow. And this is using the concept of self-assembly to make metamaterials. Meta and we see this a lot in the literature, playing with optical properties. But can we play with properties that are not optical, but instead maybe good for a heat exchanger? Uh, although not related to heat exchangers, it's this cool split ring resonator structure that plays with the magnetic field incident on a material. So instead, can we tailor a different uh, material property? Directional conductivity, strength, composition gradients. And could we have self-healing capabilities built into the microstructure? Could this restore a high temperature coating, or could this fill a crack that forms? And so again, what do I mean by growing? Harnessing the self-assembling mechanisms in biology and chemistry. And so, looking around you in this room, do you have a high temperature material for heat exchangers? Do you know of a combined manufacturing process? Or do you know how to customize the microstructure of a device? Is there someone else you could talk to here and pair up with them? And in that way, could you grow your heat exchanger or any other component of an energy system? It doesn't have to be a heat exchanger. Could you grow your company by coming up with a completely new enabling material? And then in that way, could you grow your energy impact? Thank you. And now I'll introduce uh, Grigori, Program Director. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, or well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Grigory Soloveitchik. I am a program director at RPAE, uh, and uh, I will talk about uh, next uh, stage of program development. Actually, it's kind of a late stage of program development. 
Um, Pat talked about mature uh, program. Now we are talking about program which hopefully will be released for will be released uh, by the end of the month. So I will talk about energy dense liquid fuels. Or uh, is uh, this fuel? Are these fuels a storage solution for renewable energy? And uh, I hope to give you some feeling that it is the right answer. So if you look at uh, uh, the map of the US, where is the renewable energy on the right hand side, you have for where we have wind and solar resources, and on the left hand side, where people live. And you see it is mismatch. And more renewable energy we will have, and uh, in California we'll have about 50% in 2020. It's pretty close. So, and our bulk renewable energy will move from cities to deserts, to plains, so it will be far away. And if we look at the map, we need to build actually connection between renewable energy generation and energy consumption. And this is the NREL uh, map which will show how much power lines or any connections we have to build. Okay, what are the critical needs to increase the penetration of renewable energy? There are three of them. First, uh, as I said, removable, uh, renewable energy is moving far away from uh, the population area, so we need to transport longer and longer distances. And talking about both energy, electricity, and transportation fuels. Then, uh, with the wider penetration of re intermittent renewables, like solar and wind, we need to store energy. And finally, we need to build an uh, infrastructure for that major renewable energy. It should be built and it will be expensive and all that. So, um, current, currently we, say, have two major paths for delivery. On the right side, the right hand side, are, it's classical electricity. So we have power lines, we have for bank of batteries to store energy, we finally have for a battery in you know, your car, and we can deliver you know, fuel for transportation as electrons. Or for the future transportation, and we know that hydrogen actually is gaining uh, more interest with the appearance of Toyota Mirai and other vehicles on the road, then we can just electrolyze, deliver hydrogen, and dispense it. Okay, and it's not a good or not the best way. Hydrogen transportation is very expensive because it's light. Electricity transportation requires a lot of capital and associated with losses. Okay, so what I propose uh, to actually kill these three birds with one stone. Can we deliver the technology to answer all three major needs for renewable energy. So I propose to combine energy transportation and storage and use the existing infrastructure by, conver by conversion of renewable energy into energy dense liquid fuels, then transport them, and we know how to do that. And finally, to generate electricity back or maybe hydrogen for transportation needs at the point of consumer. Okay, uh, let's compare again cost. Everything will go to convenience and cost. And if you look at the electricity uh, in this graph, you see that having a storage actually increases the cost of energy delivery dramatically. And hydrogen delivery, it's very expensive as I said, but if you look at uh, transport, uh, liquid energy dense fuels and for example, uh, we can use ammonia and or upgraded biomass. The transportation and storage cost is about the same as electricity. Uh, let's see how liquid fuels can help us to store energy. And you can see on the left uh, side, this is a liquid propane uh, tank which can be used for ammonia, for example. It, this is standard 30,000 gallon underground tank. It contains 200 megawatt hour. And it takes about 500 square feet, or, and the cost is like 100K, not much. But if you would like to store the same amount of energy as a batteries, this is a, a battery bank by NGK in Japan. 
which contains this, about the same amount, 200 megawatt hour. But the footprint is a 51,000 square feet. And uh, this big building's actually tall. Uh, to scale, it will be 15 feet tall. You can understand how big this field. And the capital cost is staggering like 50,000 or, or 100,000 K to actually store that. So it's much higher. Okay. And uh, liquid fuels will provide us smallest footprint and smallest capex. Uh, before, you know, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive that liquid fuels are so good, but uh, I can give you an example. When you charge your nice electric car like Tesla or Leaf, you deliver about 100 kilowatt power to your car. And when you fill your tank or with a gasoline, you deliver actually 100 times more power at the same uh, in your hand, so it's kind of unbelievable. So what I propose to get this uh, renewable energy, use air as a source of carbon or nitrogen and convert them into fuels. And you can ask me, oh, what about the carbon? Uh, carbon or extraction from air, probably not economical, but plant can do it easily or without any additional cost. And what we need to convert the biomass, which is not good to be used directly. We need to upgrade it, add more hydrogen, re remove oxygen, and then we can uh, basically uh, deliver these liquid fuels uh, through pipelines, tracking. And there's a lot of actually applications. We can directly use it in, uh, in uh, internal combustion engines, or we can store energy for the long term, which battery cannot do. We can generate hydrogen and so forth. So uh, our program goals would be to de develop small to medium scale direct conversion of renewable energy, water, and air into high energy density liquid fuels. And the key is a small to medium scale. We know, for example, how to make nitrogen by Haber-Bosch. It's huge plants. But uh, to make renewable energy are viable, we need to match the scale of production and engine generation. Develop cost-effective methods for fuel conversion to electricity. This is another part, how we can economically get electricity back or hydrogen. So we target a competitive cost of delivered engine. The key is also delivered, so we will consider both cost of generation, cost of transportation, cost of storage, and uh, conversion into energy or hydrogen. Uh, and we also would like to demonstrate this fuel synthesis and conversion on a batch scale prototype as a usual RPA does. So and we have a lot of benefits uh, and you can see it's reduced transportation cost, uh, long-term energy storage, use of existing liquid fuel infrastructure. We can enable fuel cells and refueling station is a major roadblock and reduce emissions of CO2 and oil imports. And I'd like to thank you and talk to me, or now, right now you can talk to me, uh, before four is issued, or, and I'm very excited about this opportunity to working with you guys. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I have a pleasure to introduce the uh, next speaker, Joe Cornelius, my fellow program director, and he's our bioenergy guru, and he will talk about new program in development as well. Thank you, Corey. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Cornelius, uh, RPE uh, Program Director. And uh, just a little bit of background myself. My, five, uh, my fast pitch on background is I'm a plant biologist by training. Uh, I'm a farmer by birth. And I'm Italian by marriage. Um, so what I'd like to share with you is a forthcoming RPE funding opportunity. Uh, in the uh, realm of greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. And what I'd like to start off with here is what if, what if we could harness a system that has no capital cost, has significant market pull, and scale? That's what we wake up every day thinking about as we try to mitigate greenhouse gas. Well, we have a system like that, and it's called biology. 
The great thing about biology is that it's like software. It gets updated routinely. It has code. We can actually improve that code. The other great thing about biology is that carbon is currency. I can't get enough carbon if I'm a biologist. It's the raw material that I build things. It makes everything I do better. I value it. The other thing about biology is that it has scale. Genetics are dispersed. They're distributed globally. And we can tap into that. Evidence. This is a snapshot of CO2 at, during a uh, late winter. That's when CO2 at the upper um, atmospheric elevations begins to peak, evidenced by the, uh, color, uh, the bright uh, red and purple. It's also an artifact of the fact that that is the low point of net photosynthetic activity on the planet. Same photograph, late summer. That's the direct result of net photosynthetic productivity. That's what we're talking about when we say we have scale. And when we look at the carbon cycle, the biosphere is among the most, if not the most, efficient cycler of CO2. 120 gigatons annually. 120 gigatons annually. And in this room, with all this incredible talent, fast forward, 120 gigatons gets absorbed, three gigatons gets sequestered long term. If that's not an inefficiency opportunity, I don't know what is. And as we look at this particular uh, ecosystem, if we were to double just the amount of carbon that we sequester within the U.S., one of the biggest strategic assets the U.S. has is a billion and a half acres of cropland, forestry, rangeland. And if we could actually impact and double just the amount of carbon we sequester, that would offset all of our transportation emissions. That's going from 0.25 uh, gigatons of carbon to 0.5. And we believe that this is achievable through roots. Roots are a triple win. First and foremost, roots actually are the end point of the sequestration cycle. Our ability to actually move carbon from the atmosphere, through the plant, into the soil, feed the microbes, mineralize it, and there we have carbon sequestration. The second thing that the roots do is that they sequester nutrients. And a significant greenhouse gas issue we have is the fertilizer we apply, over half of it ends up in the environment as nitrous oxide or as killing fields in our aquatic systems. And roots are a mechanism for us to improve the efficiency of that nitrogen uptake. And third, it's water productivity, which translates into climate resilience. Now, value. Farmer by birth. When I talk to my family about the things that we're doing, the number one thing that they talk about is not yield, it's about improve my soil because they realize that the more carbon I have, the better that soil it is, the healthier it is, the better nutrient cycling I have, the better water uh, cycling I have. It's a ready-made market. So let's get them some carbon. Now, we've made fabulous, fabulous improvements, the Green Revolution, through breeding. But 10,000 years of breeding have been a above-ground visual process. What I can see, half the plant is underground. We are not breeding, we are not selecting for 
plants that are optimizing carbon capture. And as a result, we are not advancing one of the greatest assets we have in order to be able to sequester carbon. The best tool we have today is a shovel. Any volunteers who want to go out and phenotype roots? Now, as we look at this, we believe that by developing breeding tools that can actually advance our ability to select advanced germplasm will have a massive impact. This is a completely untapped area. It's also a, a huge physics problem. It's a biology problem. It's an engineering problem. We have to bring integrated communities together to help us develop root sensors, soil sensors, mechanistic models in an integrated fashion. Biology, engineering, computational science, sensor technology. A lot of these technologies exist. And can we actually harvest them from some of these other disciplines like medicine, aerospace, engineering, military. Agriculture is always the last customer on the innovation cycle because it has to be so cheap. But this is so important. This is so valuable. And it's so complicated. Things that we're trying to achieve here is be able to understand and, and visualize root architecture so we can identify better plants. Be able to track and follow carbon partitioning and fluxing to the uh, microbiome. Being able to understand soil particle, um, uh, soil structure and the dimensions and the physics of that soil structure. Advancements in any of these, I put all three of these up, advancements in any one of these would be transformational. Remember, we're not selecting because we don't have any tools today to be able to discriminate within that population. So, as we're thinking about a, a program here, if I can get my last advancement, very high level program vision. How do we improve our ability to select for rhizosphere, which is just a, 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 a fancy way of saying root and, uh, and soil interfaces with the uh, microbial uh, environment. How do we optimize that for terrestrial carbon sequestration? And we believe if we're successful, we will not only improve soil quality, we'll dramatically improve crop productivity that has massive implications, not just for energy and for um, and food and feed, but also will contribute significantly towards greenhouse gas mitigation. And as we think about products that would be um, coming out of this program, we would anticipate improved cultivars, improved phenotypes and genotypes enabled by sensor technology and, and uh, from a root and soil perspective that will basically unlock that genetic code. Thank you very much. And I'd like now to uh, invite uh, Mark von Kites uh, to basically uh, take us to, down a different path. Joe, thank you very much. This it's a very, very hard act to follow this presentation. I'm personally so pumped about the technology, I can't wait for the FOA to release and would really like to get engaged myself. But I am here as a program director, and my job is to develop a program, and I have been here for about six months. And actually, when I arrived, there was the open FOA right in the process, and a project came across my desk that looked at macroalgae that really caught my eye and I thought well maybe there is more than a single project here and so we are in the process of right now exploring the opportunity of making a fully focused uh, funding opportunity in this space so we are not this is still the exploratory phase and I wanted to share with you a little bit the thoughts that are motivating us to look, take a closer look on this. So it's called Seaweed 2.0, and that's in recognition that we are not the first to have thought about that, but we think that maybe with some new technologies, there's really opportunities to make significant advances and bring it to a point where it has a significant impact. I would like you to start off with just the world in 2050, and we have heard this a few times during this conference, is envisioned to have over 9 billion people on Earth. And what does that really mean? So probably on the most tangible level, it means that we are needing probably about 70% more food. 
but we also want to live in a more sustainable world where we want to have more biofuels, more bio-based products. And in order to get both of these things, we really need to have more biomass that is available, so we really have to increase our production capacity for biomass. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is like even in light of the billion ton study that is currently underway and being updated with DOE, it's like where and how are we going to grow all this additional biomass? And so there's basically, when it, the question for more, there's basically two variables that we have. We either increase the area where we grow biomass or we increase the amount of biomass that we produce per area. So let's take a look at the area for cultivation first. We really actually have reached what's called peak farmland. So urbanization and degradation of farmland, so it's projected that we are losing continuously up to 2100, we are continuing to lose farmland right now. And even with the farmland that we have, we are also encountering peak freshwater. We have been really over pumping a lot of aquifers, uh, exacerbated through uh, climate change, we are probably going to experience more and more water stress. So that really leaves us in this constrained environment still with the opportunity to increase yield. And programs that Joe has initiated are definitely going to make a tremendous impact on getting that yield curve continuing to grow. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to put all our eggs in one basket and just, just the yield basket? And so what we have been thinking about is, are there possibly other opportunities that at a minimum could be just a backup solution, but maybe even more really an addition that can generate a lot of value. And so naturally, when we start looking around, there's a lot of ocean. So 70% of the world is covered by oceans. And it turns out that less than 1% of the ocean area is, 1% of our food is supplied by the oceans. At the same time, we do have a lot of light, a lot of water, and a lot of space out there. So the question really becomes, is there a way that we can harness this, cultivate this, learn how to grow materials there? And if we say, yes, what would we grow? And before I go there, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that the ocean, just what is called the exclusive economic zone in the U.S., so the water part of the U.S. is actually larger than our land area. So that's really, I think, an important thing to keep in mind. So if we want to use at least a fraction of that, what could we grow there? And so that's where the idea of macroalgae comes into play. And I want to make clear that we understand the distinction between macro and microalgae. Microalgae has been getting most of the attention over the last 10, 15 years. And it was really focused on these are microscopically small systems. As you can see here, macroalgae are macro. They're big. And what that means is besides being able to grow fast, you can quite easily harvest them. There are many different species. The, primarily the material that you find from them is carbohydrates and protein. And so, the, and it's not really a new industry. It actually exists. We are making 24 million metric tons of macroalgae every year. It's mostly for food and hydrocolloids, carrageenan. If you had a yogurt, you probably had some carrageenan in it. And it's a traditional industry, a lot of manual labor. Most of the world's production is focused on Asia, primarily China, Indonesia, with Korea and Japan. But we have a little bit of a resurgence actually here in the US as well, where we have some small artisanal algae farmers, seaweed farmers. But so there's really a momentum. So you really see new farms of this cropping up very, very rapidly. And so, but then we have to ask ourselves, well, this is nice and it's food, and, but how does it become energy relevant? And so the question then is, what is energy relevant? And we usually have 
the rule we call it, or the guidance, one quad. So one quad is a one quadrillion BTU, 10 to the 15, and that means, well, that's 13 billion gallons of ethanol. That's quite a bit. That's about 80% of our annual production capacity in the United States from corn. And so I thought, okay, let's calculate just roughly based on some numbers that we have. These are actually based on some real numbers that were generated. Uh, we would need about 18 million acres. Sounds a lot. It's about half the state of Iowa, but not that bad. So, and at the same time, it does mean we have to ramp up this industry quite a bit, probably by a factor of 100 relative to what current world production is. At the same time, we want to drive down cost. And so here's a little bit what the challenges are. When we want to go into further oceans, the water gets deeper, it gets more wavy and energetic, and at the same time, further out, we don't find as many nutrients. So we have to have technologies that allow us to access and to handle these conditions. So what we believe is that there are a number of new technologies available right now that can really facilitate this. So from satellite imaging and remote sensing, we compare, combine that with very advanced computational modeling of nutrients, of hydrodynamics, of weather, and then help in the harvest process with robotics and automation. And then on the breeding side, hopefully leapfrogging 2,000 years of development by leveraging terrestrial advanced breeding capabilities. So I just don't really have time to go into the seaweed. This is one of the ideas that emerged uh, during our workshops that we were holding just two weeks ago. And the one message that I want to leave you, this is a long-term idea that is going to be several, probably 20, 30 years out, and we have to find what we call stepping stones to commercialization. Fuel is the ultimate goal, but we probably have to have steps in between. So when we think about a program, we need to make sure that we find ways to generate revenue along the way in order to keep this program running. And so food and feed and then fuel is probably the trajectory of development. This is just a quick reminder of the workshops that we had was fantastic with 70 people, a lot of feedback. Right now we're in the process of trying to further solicit input, get feedback and trying to digest everything. And with that, I say thank you and encourage you, if you're interested in this field, see me afterwards and we are still actively collecting information or you can also send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, what we would like to do now is actually address some of the questions that have come from the audience, which are um, uh, uh, actually are quite insightful, and uh, we'll spend uh, 10 minutes uh, quickly going through those. So the first one, um, I'll go in order, uh, one question for each one of the speakers here. Uh, with, this one is for Pat. Uh, Pat, research sometimes creates more questions than it answers. What questions do you have now after AMPT? It's an interesting question on this one. Uh, is the mic on? Good. Um, I would say that we had quite a bit of work in the AMP program on physics-based models, and uh, the, the, the progress on getting uh, models that have been around for quite a while, sometimes decades, but have never been computationally tractable. Uh, we have a lot of approaches that have uh, shown them to be possible to run them in real time. Um, the question always comes though, so now that we've shown that and we're in the early stage of the validation on it, uh, the, there was a quote that I think is always misattributed mis uh, to Hans Pethe, but it's, we know all models are wrong, some models are useful. Uh, and what we really still need to determine, and, and it really can only be told through, through time and continued validation testing, as to whether the, the physics that we're building into uh, the models for these uh, advanced controls on batteries are, are right enough uh, to, to be useful so that as we're trying to open up the limits and be more aggressive with the battery while staying well within the bounds of safety, uh, are we capturing the relevant, uh, the, the relevant modes of degradation and failure modes 
uh, to make sure that there are no surprises that we didn't account for in the model. Um, it, it, our results through three years have all been very promising in, in the performance that we can get out of it. Uh, it appears to be well worth the, uh, the additional trouble of, of adding these advanced models in. Uh, but I can't answer today, we know that the model is wrong, we just don't know how wrong it is. So do we, do we have enough of the physics in there? That's, I think that's a question that we need to continue to answer over time as we build these into battery management systems. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Adrian, are there examples of biological uh, deposition of, in, from a materials and ceramics uh, standpoint? Biological deposition. Uh, so many years ago, I, I can't remember who did it, but I did see an example of uh, this idea of growing bacteria on a surface to increase uh, surface area for heat transfer. That's one thing that comes to mind. Uh, another thing uh, I've seen, I'm forgetting it now, um, oh, but the other part of the question was with ceramics mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, I have not seen this. Mm -hmm. um, something that comes to mind, I mean, I would, I would think, what are strong structures we see in nature? I'm thinking maybe coral, mm -hmm. something like that. I'm not entirely sure what coral is made of. Mm -hmm. uh, that grows on a surface. Could we, could we do something like that that would somehow uh, have a, a nice strong structure growing on a surface mm -hmm. and do it that way? Great. That's why we call these um, uh, idea uh, exercises. And actually, for many of you in the audience that actually uh, have thoughts for any of us up here in the stage, we certainly welcome uh, uh, your candid feedback either uh, uh, now or, or at a later date. Um, Grigori, um, is existing liquid fuel infrastructure really compatible with chemicals like ammonia? Are not our existing oil or gasoline infrastructure, but there is infrastructure for ammonia already existing and there are it's hundreds of miles of pipeline for ammonia to deliver from Gulf Coast to Iowa. So it's well-known technology and when uh, I think about existing infrastructure, it does mean which already exist. I mean, it's all technology is already known verified and can be built pretty quickly and non-expensively. Okay. Um, one for Joe. Uh, Joe, is overall plant growth limited? Will better root growth be at the expense of above surface growth? My quick answer to that is not on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is a bio, that's an uh, excellent question, and it's uh, one that's hotly contested within the uh, scientific community. We don't know. And that's something that we plan to, to elucidate here in a very short order. Okay. Uh, Mark. Um, Macroalgae. As pH of oceans fall due to human CO2, will this have an impact? And can oceans stand the additional stress of so much new farming? So actually, macroalgae are thriving in a lower pH environment. And so they can, they have actually been utilized. There's a project in Puget Sound, a Puget Sound restoration project that is actually trying to use macroalgae to combat acidification of the ocean. So I think especially if we are trying to utilize existing nutrients either in the eutrophied coastal zones or bringing nutrients up from deeper waters, we are not really stressing out the system by adding new nutrients that we often see in farming. Uh, Grigori, what cost uh, per kilowatt our output needs to be targeted to reach output cost parity with gasoline slash ice? <laughs> Okay, uh, it's a tough question. I know the prices for gasoline are dropping as we speak. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, what we're thinking that uh, the oil prices are in a time when this technology will be developed, it will be much higher as well. So right now, I think that to be on the same page for all applicants, uh, I would propose in a 4A the current cost of electricity, price of electricity delivered by wind farms. And we know that it's around five cents per kilowatt hour. 
then uh, it's not competitive with uh, gasoline. And believe me, if we are not care, don't care about CO2 emissions, gasoline is a good choice. Even carbon, uh, coal is a good choice if you don't care about CO2, economically. Another question for Mark. Um, assuming significant penetration, would microalgae affect the Earth's albedo? Would it increase or decrease? I assume that it was meant to be macroalgae. Macroalgae, sorry. And, and so I, I'm not quite sure that it would really affect the albedo. Mm -hmm. So because most of the ocean albedo is more in the, in the higher latitudes. And I don't know, but I don't have a definitive answer for that question. Okay. Uh, Grigori? Um, how is refuel different from ARPA-E's past electrofuels program? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, it's a good question. Uh, the previous electrofuels uh, program was based on microorganisms to do conversion of CO2 to liquid fuels. Uh, he, uh, this refuel program uh, actually targets uh, chemical processes are uh, using either electrochemical or, or conver direct conversion or maybe a kind of improvement in current chemical catalytic processes. So without basically involvement of microorganisms in the cycle. Okay. Great. Well, that um, concludes the, the session. Um, what I'd like to uh, just remind everyone that there are um, certain protocols as it relates to uh, uh, contact with uh, uh, program directors and fellows uh, prior to a uh, uh, announcement and post announcement and uh, I'm sure if I get this wrong I'll be corrected uh, but uh, uh, it's okay to for us to have some conversations prior to the release once we have a release then uh, uh, basically uh, everything has to go through a, a, a very strict uh, web portal uh, uh, web portal Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.